Good morning, everyone, on Resurrection Sunday. I want to welcome you all here and online. It's so glad, I'm so glad to have you here. Now, why, is Resu- why do we make such a fuss of Resurrection Sunday? And the reason why we do that is because according to Paul, um, the great apostle, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13 to 14, for if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has, has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and our faith is useless. So the very foundation of our faith is the resurrection. That's, that's what we build everything on. If Jesus had stayed in the grave, then that would be that, you know. We, would, we could all go home now. Um, but what's happened in the last few years is there's been a rise of what, what I think we can call internet experts. And internet experts claim have started to make really wild and fanciful claims. Some of them say Jesus didn't exist and all of that. So I'm going to read you two quotes from one of the most famous atheists in the world to prove my point. So the the first is, and his name is a guy called Bart Ehrman. So he says, despite the enormous range of opinions, there are several points on which virtually all scholars of antiquity, antiquity for those of you who don't know, ancient times agree. Jesus was a Jewish man, known to be a preacher and a teacher, who was crucified, a Roman form of execution, in Jerusalem during the reign of the Roman emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. So these are basically what he's saying is, is that no serious historian in the world and no real expert who knows anything about ancient times or antiquity, the Roman times, disputes these facts. You say, well, is this, is this guy an atheist? Wait, it gets even better. He says, Bart Ehrman says this in a NPR Um, uh, National Public Radio, I think it's called, in America, in an interview, and I'm going to give you the following quote. It is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. We know that some of these believers by name, one of them, the Apostle Paul, claims quite plainly to have seen Jesus alive after his death. So, I, I, I'm sure you're sort of looking at, uh, at this thinking, well, is this an atheist? Yes, he is an atheist. He says he doesn't believe in miracles. And so, uh, so he doesn't believe that Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. So, so my point is, is that there, there are people who've tried to say, oh, Jesus... You know, Jesus didn't exist. No serious historian in the world believes that. If you read that, you know, click on that page and shut it off because it's it's rubbish. In fact, the two foremost of the two greatest historians of our time, Niall Ferguson and Tom Holland, the two probably greatest historians of our time, have both started to go to church in the last few years. And the reason why is because it's an incontroversial um, historical fact that Jesus existed, that he preached, um, in um, the historical fact that he, that, he, that he existed, that he preached in um, Jerusalem and Israel, that they even... It's even um, agreed that his tomb was empty on Resurrection Sunday. They even admit that. They say, because you see, if they reject that, then you can't. They, they, if, if they reject these facts for, when there's so many sources, they would re- have to reject that Julius Caesar existed, for instance. So, and then who on earth would Alec? Asterix have to fight then. 
So, uh, you guys do know who Asterix is? Oblix. You know who Oblix is, but not Asterix. Oh, okay, just checking. So, the point is, is that we are here, celeb and we can know for a fact, an accepted fact, that Jesus was crucified, that he was put in a tomb, and on Easter Sunday morning, it was empty. And then we know for a fact that his followers believe that they saw him alive. And so what, when we celebrate, we celebrate not on, 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 uh, not on um, something airy-fairy or some sort of myth. We have historical facts that are established that we can base our celebration on. So, and this is what Paul says, says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 4. I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised <clears throat> again, raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of them are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born in the wrong time, I also saw him. So we have historical record, and what Paul is doing is he's establishing the, the, the witness upon witness upon witness upon witness that they had seen Jesus alive. And so... When we, when we establish our, our faith, we establish it on something concrete, something real, that there were hundreds of people that saw Jesus alive. So, um, in fact, this Bart Ehrman goes further. He says, Christians who wanted to proclaim Jesus as Messiah would not have invented the notion that he was crucified because the crucifixion created such a scandal. Indeed, the Apostle Paul calls it the chief stumbling block for Jews. Where did the tradition come from? It must have actually happened. So what he's saying is, and this is, this is on his study of, of history, is that people, that, that one of the big reasons why the Jews eventually rejected Jesus and moved and went away from their Messiah, their Messiah was because they couldn't cope with the fact that Jesus, would, Jesus died on a cross. And so he says, if you were trying to make it up, you would never say that Jesus died on a cross because this is a stumbling block to so many people. Because they were like, how can God, our Messiah, die on a cross? That would never happen. And we see that, this in Luke. Now what happens is, is that Luke um, tells us the story of two people who were walking home after about two or th uh, to Emmaus, a little town outside of Jerusalem. And, em and, um, and he, um, and they were talking together, and we're going to pick up the story. This is in Luke 24, and it says, that same day two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that ha had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. So they think Jesus is dead, as you'll see. And so Jesus starts walking with them. And suddenly came and, be and God kept them from recognizing him. He, walked, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short Sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that has happened in the last few days. And actually, it's pretty funny, you know? Um, the, the guy who died, they're saying, You, you obviously haven't heard what's going on. What things, Jesus asked, playing dumb. 
the, the thing that, that, that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet Why did powerful, who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Now, one of the interesting things is in that Talmud, they have a record of the charges that the, that the scribes and Pharisees brought a, against Jesus, and one of them was sorcery. Now, why would you, wh what is sorcery? It's performing magic acts. So what we can tell from that is that Jesus did in fact perform miracles. Because you, you don't charge, you don't charge a, 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 um, someone who pretends to do miracles and then not achieve that. What you do is you laugh at him. So they charged, the fact that we know that the Jewish leaders charged Jesus with, with sorcery is a confirmation that Jesus performed miracles. They just didn't like the miracles. But the fact, we've got historical proof that Jesus performed miracles. And let me be clear, I'm, I'm very clear that the Bible is... is um, is a good record of history. But the point is, is that we have also, we have external confirmation of what the Bible says. In law, we call that corroboration. We like corroboration, unless it goes against our point in which we don't like it at all. But, um, and so, and they, so they're telling Jesus about what happened to him. Um, And then, and then it goes even further, and it says, and then some woman from our group of followers were at his, to, to, at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they'd seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. So they know the whole story, they just can't believe it. Um. Some of our men um, ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. What it, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses And all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the, the things concerning himself. So what Jesus does is he then takes, he goes back and he says, look, this, is, this was predicted, this is what happened. The, and then over there, that was what was predicted, that was what, what happened. And he takes them through all of the, the scriptures to show that everything that had happened had been prophesied. Now, then, then God opens their eyes as they're eating, and, then G and, and they realize that all this time they'd been speaking to Jesus. Now, I think one of the reasons why they didn't see Jesus, why they didn't accept that this was in fact Jesus who was, um, who, or, or, or couldn't conceive that this was Jesus, is because, let's be honest, they were probably, um, they were probably um, had left out of disgust that people could pretend that Jesus was alive. And so, and so as, so, and, and, and the problem is, is they just couldn't conceive that Jesus was alive. They just couldn't believe that, in fact, he was, he, he had come, come back to life. And so, um, and, and so why was it so hard for these guys to believe? And that part of the reason was is because there were predictions of a suffering servant and there were predictions of a Messiah. But people couldn't believe that they were one and the same thing. Now, why did God break? And, and to be honest, if you, 
if you go through the Old Testament, if you read through it, you, all of the information about Jesus is so clearly there. But the problem is, is that it's scattered like a shotgun across the Old Testament. And so only if you, to be honest, you can only really see it in hindsight. So once you know that who Jesus was, once you know what he had done, once you know that he had died and, re- and was resurrected, it's now easy. And, and a lot of you are in Connect Group and you've gone through all of this material. You know, we've picked up here, picked up there, picked up there. And when you start to look at it, one of the things that I've learned from Connect Group is how, Jesus, how active Jesus was in the Old Testament. I hadn't really grasped that until recently. And so, why did God do this? And 1 Corinthians 2, um, 7 to 8 says, No, the wisdom that we speak is the mystery of God, His plan that was previously hidden, even though He had made it for our ultimate goal before the world began. But the rulers of this world... Um, had not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the, our glorious Lord. So if they, so if they, if they had, um, if it if it was put together in in carefully digestible language, God would never have been able to, um, been able to to trick the supernatural powers into, into killing Jesus. So that's why God had to do that. Because one of the things that we need to understand is that, that there are no robots both in the spiritual and in the natural world. So God, there's nobody that's on remote control. God has given remarkable remarkable authority and free will to all of the supernatural beings in the supernatural world and also to you. So God didn't instruct these principalities and powers, these enemies of God, to, to, to do this, to, to crucify the Lord. He had to lure them into a trap to do it. And so when you read the Old Testament, now that we see what the trap was, we're like, oh, it's so obvious. But at the time, if you you would have had to spend a lifetime studying to understand and grasp because it was so inconceivable. So and and so why did God do that? Because he, he wants to deal with these principalities and powers. And we see in Psalm 82 where he speaks to these demon princes, these principalities and powers, these authors of evil. And the people say, well, I don't know about these principalities and powers. Have you looked around lately? Have you seen the massacres? Have you seen the the wars? Have you seen the evil? Have you seen the, the pedophilia? Look around you. Think about it. How bad are humans if there's no evil spirits trying to, uh, getting them to do things? And and humans do, let me be clear, humans make their choice ultimately. But these evil spirits want to kill and destroy the human race and prevent God's plan from coming to pass. Why? Because God, God says to these rulers, in Psalm 82, verse 6 to 7, he says, I say you are gods, you are all children of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. And the Bible teaches us very clearly that hell, the final hell, was built for the devil and his demons. There has to... I, a few years ago, I ran into an, a guy who had become an atheist or agnostic, and he said, and somehow hell came up, as it often does at a party. Um, and and um, I said to him, I find it so much easier to believe in hell than heaven. And the reason why is 
is if you look at the evil around, if you look at, at Stalin and Lenin and Hitler and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and, and Hendrik Verwoerd and a lot of these guys that did so much evil, if there's no final judgment, then we live in a world that is out of control. If there's no final justice, because I spent, I've spent many years, I'm trying to work it out, um, I've spent many years in the courts, and to be honest, you try, there are a lot of people, they're trying their best for justice, but there's no final justice. If there's no final judgment, if there's no hell, then what do you do with Hitler? Our, our, what do you do with Idi Amin? You know, Kaiser Wilhelm, or no, what's his name? The Belgian ruler that, that killed eight million people in the Congo on his instruction. What do you do with this? And so, we need to understand that there is a final judgment and that the judgment is primarily directed to those who would want, that it was directed to these evil spirits, Satan, who has brought so much destruction and, and into our earth. But, I, but while I think I've shown you that the resurrection is, and let's be honest, we can see by the behavior of his followers that, some, that if, if, we, if we accept that Jesus lived, that he preached, that he was executed, and that his tomb was empty, and that his followers believed they saw him, then let's be honest, the most likely explanation for it was that he was resurrected. And that's why we can base our faith on facts. But that isn't the full story. The full story is that Jesus was glorified through his death and resurrection. And I want to show you what that means. And so Jesus says in John 12, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So what does that look like? And, it, and Philippians 2, verse 7 to 11 says, Instead, he gave his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Because God, Jesus was the king of, was, was in glory, in opulence like we can't imagine or, or, or conceive of. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, and this is where I really want to go. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so, and so what does this glorification look like? What does this exaltation look like? And Daniel 7 verses um, 9 to 10 tells us, and actually we'll, we'll jump to 13 and 14 shortly after this, and Daniel sees the scene when Jesus arrives back from after, after being willing to suffer, die on a criminal's cross, and, be res and then was resurrected. And, and he says, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat to judge, and his clothing was as white as snow, and his hair like the purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a um, river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. The, the, the God the Father is so powerful, so great, that their fire comes from him. And a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his pres presence. And I want you to close your eyes and imagine this, what I'm about to read to you. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were opened. Can you imagine the scene? 
this incredible scene. Because when you do, you realize that Jesus' willingness to die on a cross, basically all alone, was all the more remarkable because this is what he left. But, they, but what the scene is, is Jesus being about to be received back into heaven, and everybody is there to come and see the one who has done the greatest thing the world, the universe had ever seen. Millions of angels. There was a, there was, if, if think of the, the biggest crowd you've ever seen and multiply it by millions. These, these fiery, powerful beings. And Daniel says, as my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a man, a son of man coming down with clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So this is what happened to Jesus when he returned into the presence of his father. He, he was rewarded with a, with a kingdom that will never end. You wonder, well, where's this kingdom? This kingdom is here. We're a small, tiny part of this kingdom as the people around the globe celebrate Easter today. And so... It says in Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 8, this is the amazing thing. So we've, we've spoken about the resurrection. We've spoken about the exaltation of Jesus and how he was seated next to the Father and given a kingdom. And then Paul says to us in Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. And so God has given us a position right next to the glorified Jesus. God has given, assigned us a throne next to Jesus, and we, sta we sit with him in heavenly places. We are, because of the authority and power that he won through his great sacrifice, he has given us a seat right next to him. And he's given us authority and power through him. Why? Because he was willing to go, to, he wasn't just willing to go to the cross and become a, become a human and willing to go to the cross and be resurrected. He loved us so much that he also gave, gave us a position of authority and power with him. We share with him his exaltation. And so, not, and then it gets even better from there. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 um, to 23 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. But there is an order to this resurrect resurrection. Christ, Christ was raised as the first of, of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And so what what we have is the hope, the great hope, that, that, that we will be resurrected with Christ. That to die right now is to be with Jesus. To die right now, and, and that we will be resurrected, our bodies will be resurrected, because God has promised us a new earth and a new heaven. Why did He need to do that? Because we support we spoiled the old earth and the old heaven. There is a hope that we can base. You say, well, this sounds crazy. Yes, but a man planning his own death and his own resurrection is even crazier. 
if someone like that tells you that he's going to make the, earth, the new heaven and new earth and you are going to live with him forever, then you need to believe him because he pulled off the last trick. We can, we've got confidence in that. And so I'm going to ask the ashes to come forward as we move into communion. I want to thank Bomza and the team and the ashes for all their work and getting this ready for us. For, this is their third service, one more service to go for Easter. I want to thank them for their service to us. If you missed out on um, either, the, we're going to hand the, the wafers out, but the grape juice, we, it's coming. If you haven't got one, take one, please. Let them know. And so, but it even, but it gets, it's starting to sound like an infomercial, but it's not. Because it gets even better than that. Even better than that. This is just good news after good news after good news. And it says, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and, with, and, the, trumpet's call of the, and the trumpet call of God. First believers who've died will, ra- will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we are still alive and remain on the earth. We'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So Jesus is going to return. Jesus is going to return one day. We're going to hear a a shout and a trumpet call. Why shout and a trumpet call? Whenever God moves, whenever he does something, there's always a shout and a trumpet call. That's how he goes. That's how he rolls. It's true. Again and again. If you hear a shout and a trumpet call, look around. Something's probably happening. That's how he goes around. The U.S. president's got that big, heavy big heavy car my God has a trumpet call a shout and a cloud and he comes and he's going to return one day you say wow well this sounds this sounds almost too good to be true but as I said I've shown you that the most likely that, that, that Jesus died that Jesus existed Jesus died that he was executed on a cross. These are all incontrovertible historical facts. And that the tomb was empty. And then that his disciples believed they saw him and they lived the rest of their lives. As if on that, they built the rest of their lives on that basis. And this tradition of how each of them died. The only one that survived was the Apostle John, the one that Jesus loved. But even they tried to execute him. They chucked him into a pot of boiling oil, but they, he wasn't burnt. They put, him on the, they put him on the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote Revelation. And, and they, what they did is they, they pulled the boat up into the, the sort of shallows, into the waves, and they chucked him out the boat. And they left him with the the worst murderers, the worst people. And when when they came back three years or, I don't know, a year or however long it was, when they came back to fetch him, he had all of these terrible criminals stood on the beach and sang hymns to Jesus. as he got back on the boat and went home to Ephesus. And so, today we have a great hope that Jesus is going to fetch us. But sadly, that's not the end of the story. The end of the story. In Matthew 
13, verse 40 to 43. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send His angels and they will remove His kingdom um, from His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace and where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone who, with ears to hear should listen and understand. Say, well, would a righteous God throw people, would a loving God throw people into, je- into hell? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Who was, who was hell built for? Satan and his angels, his demons, all of those who've, who've, who's brought such destruction, such terrible evil on the earth. There has to be a final judgment for them. And those who choose to go with them will end up in hell with them. You see, a loving God honors your choices. He's giving you an opportunity now to make the choice to follow Jesus, to serve Jesus. But guess what? He honors your, your, your choice should you want to to go to hell there's going to be a judgment and there's two places you either come to heaven you repent you deal with the evil you allow God to deal with the evil and wash your sins away or you choose to go to the the destination of the evil one of Satan where there's weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth ultimately God respects your choice it's up to you and so when we come to the table what we're doing because Jesus came and he died and he gave up his life so that we could be saved. So when we come to the table, what are we doing? We're celebrating. We're celebrating. What? We're celebrating that the King of glory, the King of glory, was willing to become a little baby, to grow up and be parented, and then teach his disciples and then give up his life to die so that you did not have to end up with the devil and his demons but you could be with Jesus forever he's he's given you the option do we take it And so today we celebrate in communion. We're taking communion together. And we're celebrating that Jesus was willing to pay a price so that we could be free. And if we accept it, the news just gets better and better and better. And I walk. And so let's take, get the bread, and I want us to pray together, and I want to say, let's say together, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for resurrecting him. Thank you that he was willing to have his body broken for me so that I can live with you forever. Let's take the bread. Let's take the cup and say, Father, 
thank you that because of the blood of Jesus, I am always welcome in your presence. Thank you that I can be with you all the time because of Jesus' sacrifice. Let's take it together. Now, I want to give you an opportunity. Most of you have heard this message or some form of it in, the, in your life. But you don't necessarily have security of salvation or you've never made the decision to accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Or alternatively, you've lost your security of in your salvation you've gone your own way I want to pray for you and help you because the news is either really terrible or really good and I want the news to be good for you and so I ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes if you want prayer today to come into the family of God we want to help you and you need that please raise your hand and say I want to join and become part of the family of God today. Pray for me. Please raise your hand if you, if you want help today on Resurrection Sunday. I see that hand. Who else needs prayer? Quickly, I, I don't want to pressure you, but we're not going to take long. Oh, thinking, you know, at a place right now, at home, or wherever you might be, that you don't know whether or not you're going to end up in hell or go to heaven with Jesus one day when he comes back. And maybe you need to make that decision this morning, or you need to call out to the Lord and ask him to become Lord of your life, to understand the gospel, to understand and believe in it, and what he's done for you. This was... A message to understand that Jesus is our great and our only hope to live a life of righteousness, to live a life that glorifies Him, that honors Him. And if today you don't know in your heart, you're not sure, maybe you've never even heard of the gospel this morning, I, I want to plead with you that you understand that there's this incredible sacrifice that Jesus made to come as a human. The Bible describes it as he humbled himself as a human. Because he's God, he didn't have to come as man. But that's what he did. And he came as a human, went through life, went through the, the abuse, the mocking. The, those, you know, on Friday we celebrated how he was, not celebrated, but we remembered how he was abused and hurt and slashed and whipped for our, trans, for our transgressions, our sin. So when we understand this incredible act and sacrifice the Lord has done, we have nothing else but to give back to Him, to give life back to Him. So in the comments, I see someone even watching from Qatar. I want to welcome you. Um, but in the comments, if you feel like you are that person that doesn't know the Lord yet, or you may be struggling and feel like you're not at that place, won't you just say, that's me, and I want prayer. And I want to encounter, encounter the Lord and I want the Lord to become real to me because the Bible says the only way that we come into to fellowship, into communion with the Lord um, is through our faith and belief in Him, believing in the gospel. So this morning I want to encourage anyone online that if you don't know God, now is your opportunity. So Lord... As the people are listening this morning, let's just pray. I just want to pray over every person, even if you didn't put the comments there yet. Lord, I pray that you will open up heaven's gates right now in the name of Jesus. I ask, Lord, that according to your will and plan for each person online right now, that your will will be done in their lives, Lord, that you will meet them, that you will reveal yourself to them, Father God.
Lord, I thank you for true salvation in the name of Jesus. A salvation that doesn't just last for three days, but a salvation that lasts for, for a lifetime till the day that you return. Lord, your word also says that you will keep us blameless until your day of return. So right now in the name of Jesus, whatever is hindering you, for, from being blameless, from being righteous, from walking in righteousness. I want to ask that the Lord Himself will keep you blameless, that the Lord will guide you, will guide your steps, will guide your life and the way you do things and everything you do. I pray that He will do that for you, that you will not do anything in your will and your power and your strength, but through Him, because it is only because of Him that we are here. It is by His grace that we are saved. In Ephesians, the Bible says that it is only by grace that you are saved, not because of who we are, but because it's a gift from God. So this morning, I pray that you will understand this incredible gift that the Lord has given us, this incredible um, sacrifice that He made. Lord, we pray for revelation and understanding of the sacrifice in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will meet everyone where they are right now, meet their needs, meet them with at their place of where they're standing or sitting right now in the name of Jesus. So I thank you, Lord. We thank you. We worship you. We glorify your name for what you've done for us. You are so, so worthy. We are so grateful for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday. Have an incredible, incredible day further and Eat a lot of food because I know it's, it's going to be a great Sunday lunch. But enjoy it and God bless you.